conversion rate and sometimes we, nowadays we are all worried about you know the the infrastructures and we want to extend the life of the infrastructures so how do you extend the life of infrastructures by looking at the lot of chemical behavior of the assets i would know how long the asset will last actually of course it's a very fun it's always fun to do the chemical things because not straight forward you always try to understand it like understanding a baby and baby is crying you don't know why it's is it because you're hungry because something is better it and all like this only what you see is a cry right so you are trying to understand it is so very similar to this you only understand there's a relation between current and potentials and it is for us to interpret now so how do you really interpret this <coughs> now we all know a simple equation which is called as ohm's law ohm's law gives a relation between potential and the current right potential and current is related to resistance in a linear manner so i take a resistor i find out the value of resistor by looking at the relationship what is the relationship e equal to ir so i know e i know uh, uh, i i so i can simply calculate the r value but in the electrochemical interface the relation between potential and current are not that simple and the great guys the butler or amar these two guys they formulated the equation again there are again derivations you that you want to read the derivation in look at the bakris and ready volume you know book you will have a nice illustration how to derive the equation called so the current that you are going to measure okay in the system is related to what is called as a over voltage uh, that of piper that is the deviation from the equilibrium okay and of course you call a symmetric factor that over here okay and and even if you have this and of course you know the you may not know you can calculate exchange current density right so it, the exchange current density the over voltage and of course this this factor that you see here are related to the current so what are the current consist of the current actually consist of the anodic current occurring on the metal surface minus the cathodic current occurring on the metal surface now you are going to simplify this um, this one and all these guys can be converted to into into rt by um, f beta 2.3 is called as a tafel slope the slope is what in fact the tafel uh, got this uh, slope you, you much before the butler warmer equation was evolved he got it by simple experimentation so you have this something called a tafel slope so tafel slope is an important parameter in electrochemistry and even for corrosion the exchange current is an important parameter in electrochemistry as well as in corrosion okay that talks about the behavior of the metal now what is this over voltage we all know that over voltage is nothing but up, you know equilibrium um, sorry, i'm sorry for that it should be equilibrium potential plus the over voltage gives you the applied voltage here okay so applied minus uh, equilibrium potential gives you the over voltage so you have a relation between current and potential that's what is done in this is, this is applicable for all electrochemical systems just not only for corrosion or any electrochemical systems and for corrosion it becomes uh, more complicated because in a corrosion process you seen before corrosion occurs just not by one equilibrium there are by two equilibrium right one is an oxidation other is a reduction process and and so it is we call it as a mixed potential you know that again i am going to skip the discussion of mixed potentials so the corrosion potential and corrosion current is the result of net oxidation of the metal and the net reduction of the environment not the metal the reduction is coming from the environment and oxidation comes from the metal so what you are looking at is the 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 the, 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 the tafel equations they are independent one they are not same as the old one you see here this is for the oxidation of the metal you see here and it is for the reduction of the current species that is mainly coming from the solution so this is mainly from solution and it is main it is only from the metal actually so you cannot get confused between this what all so this is entirely depend upon the solution here depends upon the uh, of, on the um, on the um, on, on the metal but when i say solution please don't mistake me that metal also contributes for example the exchange current density that you see on the metal is simple on the metal only right when i say when i say this it depends on the solution i mean the species that are getting reduced are from the solution and metal it does play important role 
Okay, so again, in this case, when it, the war voltage is redefined here as as uh, related to applied potentials and the corrosion potentials and the war voltage. Okay, because we are talking about war voltage here is in relation relation to e car the corrosion potentials, not in relation to the uh, the equilibrium uh, potential at all. <coughs> Excuse me. So this stable equation is all you know. I think see one of the important things that we need to people make a mistake is that these equations are valid only when eta is very large. When eta is very small, then this is not equation. When eta is small, you get this here. So this is this is one of the things people often make a mistake that the extrapolation that you make are valid only when eta is large because when eta is large, one of this becomes uh, very negligible and you start using. For example, if eta is going to be large and positive. This becomes dominant, becomes zero, close to zero, and a negative. This becomes almost zero. This becomes like this. So you are going to again measure current either due to anodic reaction or due to cathodic reaction. And again, we have to be familiar with the Evans diagrams. If you are not very familiar with Evans diagram, the interpretation becomes very very difficult actually. Okay, the Evans diagrams are very important. Just now we talked about E car. What is E car here? E car is the result of Two equilibria that we talk about in this case the equilibria of of the uh, hydrogen equilibria we, we have here and the metal equilibria that I have here right metal has got a relative negative potentials and hydrogen equilibrium has um, relatively positive potentials now because there are two different potentials apart then they start polarizing this guy starts moving towards negative potentials and this guy starts moving towards the positive potentials you have place where the rate of the oxidation is equal to the reduction you get e car as i car here so what we are doing do is we are going to measure only I car and E car here, and of course we are going to measure the travel slopes in addition to this. So this diagram is is very important, and this has to be kept in mind before we start analyzing the electrochemical polarizing curves. So having now seen the the kinetic equations, the relation between current and the potentials, we also seen the Evans diagram. But you are not going to get a typical Evans diagram in any of your electrochemical test. You have to construct an Evans diagram, right? So what you do in a typical electrochemical test is that when you are going to put a metal in a in an environment, you are going to get a potential which is equal to the corrosion potentials. This is the potential you are going to measure. You are not able to measure I car. That's what you are going to now calculate, right? You can't measure directly. So how we are going to get this is from this. So when you when you typically when you do a polarization experiment. I would rather normally recommend that you start from the corrosion potentials, come down here, disconnect it again, allow it to, to go to the steady state and go over here and start doing it. Okay. So you start scanning. So you can do this uh, TAFL plot by two means either you can control potentials and get the corresponding current or control the current and get the corresponding potentials. We call the former one as potential static and the later one as the galvanostatic to do that. So, so if you are going to be a little more, you know, easy going, and you can start from these potentials. That's what you do, and then go up to this point, and then start scanning like this. So this is what typically you get a, a kind of curve in, um, you know, in uh, in, in any any typical experimentation. So mild steel and hydrochloric acid is one example that you have here. Suppose I want to really measure the values of uh, this thing. What you measured about the um, the uh, current density, so on. So this is how you do. Normally, if you are going to be doing experiment, you normally do this way only, right? You start uh, start from here and scan, and then you go towards analytic direction, and you will start obtaining the kinetic parameters. What are this? You draw a tangent here, which of course is um, is, is the eta must be sufficiently large so that the analytic reaction is not interfering at all. Because when you see at this particular potentials, you stop at this this particular line. The current is very small actually, right? So it is going to predominantly pick the cathodic reaction. Okay. And you and this is for the hydrogen revolution reaction. And this is your equilibrium potentials. And how do you get the equilibrium potentials? That you can get only by knowing the pH values, approximately knowing what is the hydrogen partial pressure. And do that. Similarly, you draw a tough line for this and you get this one. Okay. So we get this um, values. And you start, you know, obtaining the data one after another. Okay. So now, as you see here, okay. Now you see here now, okay. 
Um, so you can get exchange income density. How do you get exchange income density? You can get exchange income density only when you know the equilibrium component, right? Which, so that means you cannot forget the thermodynamics at all. So you need to get this value. Similarly, you know you need to get the, the equilibrium potential of ion, and at that particular place, you can you can just make intersection to get the exchange income density for ion as well as for um, hydrogen equilibrium on metal surfaces. So you have a tapping slopes, anodic and tapping tapping slopes. These are now look at this. These are typical events diagram you see here. Of course, I don't know this. I just draw. I I, I don't think you can really calculate. You, you can even measure this at all. It's not possible to measure this at all. So, but I just only for sake of completion, I drawn this. But this is not possible for you to um, get these values uh, in in typical polarization curves. So the table extrapolation have to be extremely careful. Uh, at least uh, you you need to find that at least one. Uh, you know, you should have one order, one decade of current density. The 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 the, the, the polarization curve should show exhibit linearity. If it's not, then simply you simply surrender. Say that no, I cannot measure uh, tapel, uh, I can't determine tapel slope, and so I can't measure the ECR, and I cannot measure the uh, current density, uh, current current density at all. So we need to just see this. If it's not satisfied at all, no way that we can we can get these values. So extrapolation must be 50 to 100 millivolt aka above or below the car value. It should be done. Of course, there are also softwares available uh, which is using the nonlinear uh, d square fitting to fit the uh, polarization curves. It must be robot, uh, robust software. I always say that you must cross check. You take the printout, you, you, you draw yourself, and you see that the value that you calculated is agreeing with the software value. It is not. I think you have to be worried about the software that you want to use it. So I have given you broad outline about the electrochemical uh, techniques and uh, you know and how we can study the corrosion behavior. What I'm going to do is I'm going to give three case studies. If time permits, I'll go to the fourth case study actually. Okay, and um, uh, yeah, fifth, fifth case study I'll do that to just show you how we interpret or misinterpret the data. Again, I need to be emphasizing that I am not going to, I'm not going to have time to talk about all aspects of analysis. But what I felt maybe a little easier for you that you should be careful. You should look at some of these information. Maybe it, 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 you know, uh, in, in, you know, for that you need to understand the science. You need to understand the metal itself. So that's the point. The point here is not to show that these are the ways that you should be done. The point here is to show you that what are the complexities involved and how to understand the electrochemical polarization curves. Now let me go here. I think this is by one of my students uh, did this study actually. Okay. Um, now you see this is actually um, a stainless steel. Uh, it consists of eighteen chromium. Two molybdenum and one percent nitrogen here. Okay. And of course, there is one more stainless steel. This is three sixteen stainless steel. This uh, Dr. Arya now is a faculty at uh, NIT Suratal. Did a very nice work actually. And he took this alloy, both alloys actually. He carried out polarization studies um, in in a, in a sulfate solution okay, of varying pH. The pH was seven. The pH was three. In two pH conditions. He studied this alloy, and then these are the polarization curves. The black one is 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 um, it's not really a black one actually because there's so many uh, all these legends are close by here. Also, okay, so this is actually actually corresponds to the the, the, the alloy, um, uh, the sulfate solution whose pH is about seven. Actually. This is for pH seven, and uh, the, the blue one this corresponds to the same alloy for the pH of pH of 3. Okay. So this is a little acidic pH and this is a neutral pH. And uh, 316 is, is what this is actually, right? This is 316. Now we calculate all this. Now if you look at here, people interpret this as a pitting. Pitting has taken place. Why you call pitting has taken place? Because there is a passivation, we all know about it. And there is increase in current, we start interpreting this as a pitting. Also, you know, if you all know a little more closely that you can see that there is a spontaneous passivation. Why spontaneous? 
because there is no active passive transition and uh, the corrosion potential from the corrosion potential itself, there is a passivation scarf here like this. So there is no active passive transition. Why does the lie not showing active passive transition? Because the corrosion potential lies in the passive region of the alloy. Okay. So that for that you need to know the events diagram. Let me come back to the point here. Now, when looking at this, then there's a pitching. Okay. Is it undergoing pitting at all? Then you should look at the poor bed diagram. Okay, let's look at the poor bed diagram here and see whether should it go pitting or should it not undergo pitting at all. So let's look at this potential where there is an inflection point. The potential is, is about is about is between 1.5 to about 1 volt with respect to saturated column electrode. Please see this, and I think I'm sorry I made a mistake here. Yeah, not a mistake here. No, no problem. Okay. So please look at this potential corresponds to the standard hydrogen electrode. But this potential corresponds to the saturated column electrode. That means if you calculate that, it should be going a little up again, right? Go up here. So now you see this when you measure these potentials. Okay. Now this potential is, is above 1 volt. Now pH is 7, right? Look at the pH is 7. Okay. Look at this value about pH 7. You intersect this. This line intersects this high, this the oxygen. This is this is the equilibrium, right? Oxygen plus 4 H plus so 4 electron gives you water. You move up, you get oxygen evolution reaction. Move down. The oxygen gets reduced. So if the potential lies above these potentials, above these particular potentials, the oxygen evolution takes place. So look at this. What is the potential here? That is a little lower than one volt. Okay, is the equilibrium potential for this one, and above these potentials, the oxygen will start evolving. So that means you see that above these potentials, there is a huge chance of oxygen evolution reaction. Whether pitting occurs or not is not is not the is not the only point. The point is for sure this current is due to the oxygen evolution reaction. Whether pitting takes place or not, that of course you need to resolve. But you cannot ignore that the reaction here is due to hydrogen evolution reaction, and simply you cannot attribute to pitting at all. So how do you really look at it? Okay, look at it by the surface. So we look at the uh, this alloy 18 chromium 2 moly 1 nitrogen here, and you don't see any pitting at all. But you look at 316 as a pitting at all here. So the point I am trying to look at here is the thermodynamic tendency of reaction or a pull diagram are as important as the polarization curves and start interpreting the mechanism of corrosion process that can never be forgotten at all. Now, not only that, it is also important that you use a complementary technique to arrive at the conclusion. Many, many times people don't even take the sample to microscope. It's a very important one. We need to take the microscope and see what happens. Okay, you will, and the microscope will tell you a lot many stories that the, the electrochemical technique has not told. And you can put them together, you can arrive at the conclusion what is the reason for a particular polarization curve behaving in a particular manner. So it has to be seen, it has to be backed up. Electrochemical techniques, as I told you, is a black box. You have a current and potentials. What really happens? Interpretation is not straightforward. We need to you need to back up with your analysis. Without that, it is not possible for you to arrive at the right conclusions. <coughs> now there are sometimes very complex and very complicated processes can happen on on uh, alloy systems. Actually, I will show you an example here and how the electrochemical polarization curve can get complicated. Uh, one of my students again, his name is um, uh, Bobby Cannon. He is a faculty at uh, Australia actually. He worked on aluminum alloys. And, you know, aluminum alloys are known for application in aircrafts actually, because of lightweight. And you become lightweight because uh, you add various alloying elements like zinc, magnesium, copper. You do a heat treatment, you do a heat treatment, you get a lot of microstructures getting evolved in the alloy. 
Now, when you are going to do polarization curves and you are going to, you, you get into a lot of complexities. Okay. Let me now come to the problem of this aluminum alloys. What do the three actually? One of the problem with these aluminum alloys is uh, something called as exfoliation corrosion. That is, corrosion occurs along the grain boundaries and it starts you know, flaking off, something like flaking off. And that is a problem in, in one kind of aging called peak aging condition. At that conditions, the alloy suffers exfoliation corrosion. You know? And when you do a, some kind of aging more, we call over aging, it does not undergo the problem. Now, you see, the objective is clear. What is the objective? The objective is that why does the alloy undergoes exfoliation? So, what is the electrochemical behavior? So, there is a clear objective. So, we are trying to probe that one using electrochemical technique. Right? So, look at the... So, the one we shown here was... It's, 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 it's a... It's a it's a stereo microscope, uh, you know, uh, the aluminum alloy exposed to a, we call a test called ESCO test. It's a nitric acid test, actually. So, you put them in nitric acid and they start corroding like this. And if you make a cross section, you see, that's what this you should do. Actually, you should always try to probe. When you do a cross section, you make cross section, you see the corrosion. I hope you're able to see. Now, the, the attack is going something like that. The grain is just flicking off without corrosion. So, attack is along the grain boundaries, the peak age conditions, the over, in underage conditions. In, in the overage, it doesn't happen. It also doesn't happen in the dominant conditions. So, the kind of attack that takes place in the alloy, depending upon the heat treatment. When heat treatment happens, there are change in microstructure, change in composition, and so on and so forth. Okay? So, we need to first of all understand this. So, I asked him to do carry out a polarization study. For three alloys, underaged, peak aged, and overage kind of. Three aging conditions, you develop different microstructures of this alloy, you carry out polarization. Now you see, if you look at now very closely, now what you see here, this cathodic curve is not potential dependent, almost potential independent. What does it mean? When you change the potential, the current does not change at all. So this is what is called a diffusion control. In fact, one cannot use this, this kind of uh, to get the tower slow, now you use this, uh, use this, uh, you know, uh, this cathodic region to, to to get the I core values. Not possible. Simply not possible because it is not following the tower relationship. So we are not really determining the, the determining the uh, the the E core and I core value based on this. But what is also very clear is one thing you can notice that if you have three kind of aging, see this is called uh, under aging conditions. And you have peak aging and over aging. Please notice that the current is increasing now. That means the cathodic kinetics of this alloy is changing actually. Even the diffusion control reaction is changing. Okay. And of course, I mean, we have to be a little more careful about it. Now, when you say diffusion control, it should not depend upon the alloy. It should be depending upon what? Depending only on solution at all, right? That's what your, um, um, your fixed law says. The fixed law says the only concentration gradient. It does not depend upon all I here. Now, we also found that this increase in is happening because of hydrogen. We will come back to this later. Okay. So, the hydrogen evolution has pushed the curve to the right side. So, this is all the kind of problem that you normally analyze. You come into, uh, you know, in, into problem when you start analyzing these curves. Unless you have secondary technique, it's very difficult for you to interpret why they are really happening at all. So, it's about cathodic curve. So, you cannot, the point here is that you cannot use this for extrapolation. To get the E car and I car values. But look at the anodic curves. <laughs> Excuse me. The anodic curve shows a very, very special characteristic here. You see that there is, you see here very clearly that you know, this is a peak aging, it shows some kind of passivity, and uh, under aging shows the passivity, it does not show anything in terms of the overage conditions. So, I mean, you start according as passivation here. And we know that aluminum alloy does not passivate. You take the alloy, Put it in the solution, you start fitting here itself. At E card, it starts fitting. Why does it really take place? That's the question that you are going to pose. Actually. Why does why do you why do you think that the current is decreasing now? So that's the question they started asking. Okay. So the so then what we did was we started deaerating it, right? You start deaerating it, you see the corrosion potential drops down here. Now the diffusion current 
because oxygen there is almost disappeared because the oxygen is no more present now we found that the current is now following this line and this is due to what this is due to water reduction of the process now this is not in taking place this is due to water reduction and due to hydrogen reduction process now in this curve you see, oops now you see that there is is, is, is is a kind of a peak that is appearing here so so we are trying to find out why these peaks are really happening that's what the question was now how this happening so we start looking at it so you expand that peak see that there is a clear looks like a passivation right why does it really happen that's a question that we have been posed now how we resolved it we resolved it by looking at the sample you know using the microscope as a start polarizing it now when you when you take the sample and put them in the solution start polarizing from here and move up to here and start moving here now we start moving now the surface is lustrous up to this point surface is quite bright no problem we need microscope and here from this onwards the corrosion takes place it's a corrosion takes place right you see there is this it loses the shining because it forms a corrosion product corrosion becomes severe here and start moving up here it turns brown and you start getting hydrogen evolution here please notice there is hydrogen evolution taking place at this particular point then when hydrogen evolution takes place that is the reason why it taking place right how does hydrogen evolution takes place the hydrogen evolution takes place because h plus will take electrons and the hydrogen starts evolving that means the electron is consumed here when the electron is consumed now the net current decreases why net current measured by the potential start becomes less because some current is taken by some electrons taken by hydrogen hydrogen reaction so this dip what you see is not due to passivation it is due to secondary reaction taking place what is secondary reaction the secondary reaction is hydrogen evolution process can hydrogen evolve here oh i have done anodic polarization please look at oh i have done anodic polarization from here why do i think that the hydrogen evolution that's the question don't start asking now if you look at here the hydrogen evolution is not very difficult to understand why look at the potential here now the potential is minus 0.72 So minus 0.72 is not anodic to the hydrogen equilibrium. This is anodic curve, no doubt. But this potential is still is negative compared to hydrogen equilibrium. That means the hydrogen is not revolving on the surface at all. So this thermodynamic of aluminum is different from the thermodynamics of hydrogen evolution reaction. So hydrogen evolution reaction occurs at this particular place. and so there is a dip in the current actually so the interpretation now here is not due to passivation it is due to hydrogen evolution so how we can do that you can see it with the naked eye you can take it to, to the mass spectroscopy to analyze what the uh, gas evolution was actually of course there is no way that you can have hydrogen evolution here so only hydrogen evolution can be the take place so you can able to resolve this electrochemical technique by using a complementary technique uh, or or you know technique so you can again take it to the take it to the microscope you can also see that at different potentials what we are happening at all the kind of attack taking place so all this can be done actually right you take a pk so what i am again trying to conclude is current potential measurements the current we measure are indirect we need to get the, 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 the mechanisms you need to use a complementary technique in order to understand what happens so you need to use microscopy or use other technique to support your corrosion processes so uh, in fact we we saw this at different potential minus 740 you see that some of these uh, you know coarse intermetallics got corroded you see here now and a 720 there are other kind of intermetallics are you know interface getting corroded minus 700 the grain bond is getting attacked see the grain bond is getting attacked and this way the hydrogen evolution starts to take place that is due to due to the granular corrosion taking place and at 700 grain starts to fall in you can see that you know these are the ways that you can you can analyze and understand the polarization curves actually i am going to uh, i want to now illustrate the complexities of of the electrochemical corrosion test okay and um, this was uh, another study um, so again you know it's, it's a study on developing a zinc coating for uh, 
for the um, uh, you know zinc coating for uh, for the steel production actually so what he did was he developed various kind of zinc alloys you know zinc coatings he wanted to improve the performance of zinc it's a na is a phd work on two complete phd work but i'm going to show only a part of it to tell you how important it is for you to analyze the polarization curves with care actually okay now what you know you take a pure pure zinc here and you add some alloying element the grains uh, changes you know the grains are changing and there's a grain refinement we call it this metallurgy guys uh, start understanding it more so you don't have to worry too much about it actually, okay all, all, I, all i'm trying to say is that by addition of alloying element the microstructure really changes when microstructure changes um, you know you can look at the grain size the grain size decreases and again it almost increases like this the element it changes the grain size of the model so when it does this it also changes the corrosion behavior quite a bit okay and you see now here corrosion rate versus the uh, additional alloying element in both cases with 0.02 the corrosion rate is decreasing now you see that see, it's always important now people sometimes ignore weight loss measurement i always suggest that you should always do weight loss measurement it was measurement is not an inferior technique you can see this you can see both are you know forming some more so the corrosion rate is decreasing here now what he did was he did um, he did some electrochemical test huh see how he behaving he took the coating and it deformed the coating okay because in, in industry for, for example automobile companies the car bodies they are stretched they are formed when you form it i asked them how it behaves how does this coating behaves that was that was the that was the study so what we did was we carried out polarization curves now this polarization diagram is uh, is obtained on on um, on the steel and uh, alloy containing this in in what in sodium chloride solution the curve this corresponds to is a pure steel pure steel not a pure steel and look at the polarization curves it goes anodic here sorry the cathodic here and goes anodic here there's a clear anodic uh, double slope you can see here but then there is you know mixed control diffusion control there's not clear taffel line here okay there's a problem but you can use anodic curve to get the e car value and get the i car values now getting e car i car is okay is is this reasonably okay but what it did was you look at anodic curves anodic curve for steel goes steep like that goes like this no problem but that of the coated steel this is the uh, the the cathodic curve and you see the anodic curve the anodic curve goes like that increases and then it starts looking like this it looks like as though there's a passivation in place literally he came and told me oh it is passivating i said what zinc cannot be passivating in sodium chloride solution impossible right how is it possible to do that it's not possible so i said no it cannot happen then i asked him please go and look at the sample in the microscope he took the sample out of polarization up to this point and he found the coating as completely dissolved the coating did not did not uh, last longer what does it mean please look at when you do polarization anodically you polarize it zinc dissolves and dissolves dissolves and then after some time because these are all few micron thick coating right and the few micron thick coating and the coating dissolves and so current that we measured here is not exactly due to coating it's partly dissolved coating and partly remain here now okay so but you can understand one thing steel has this particular potentials zinc uh, coated one has this potential because this is you know zinc is used as a sacrificial anode right so it has minus 1.1 that well, looks fine no problem okay but what is this is a problem so when you look at this sample in the microscope we found that at this point of time no coating was remaining so what we did we used this this particular curve for a different manner how did we use it okay we used it okay for the deformation study what we did was see in a, in a, in a company in like uh, like tata motors or mahindra and all like what they do is uh, the hard deep galvanized uh, steel structure is you know is stretched to form sheet metal right hard body has to form when it forms then how much of how much of coating remains on the surface how do you quantify it 
So we started quantifying that. We quantifying in a different manner. What do we do? This undeformed, then we deform it using by this for biaxial stresses, twenty two percent, thirty nine percent, and and fifty nine. They are they are strain, huh? They are strain. So you have strained this one, stretched it to twenty seven per twenty two percent, thirty nine percent, fifty nine percent. When you stretch it, the coating is going to be popping up, will fall out. So we use the polarization curve to find out how much of coating is remaining on the surface. Same polarization curve, potential versus uh, log current. What we did was, I go back to this. What I asked him to do was, I asked him to integrate this curve. You can integrate this curve and integrate it. What happens? You integrate the current, you get a Coulomb's the amount of current that metal has gone, right? How much of how much of metal it is dissolved? So that is the Coulomb's now. So you 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 just integrate, you know, uh, the the um, The current, okay, from potential E car. From E car, you start integrating. The Q value increases. What is Q? Q increases means the amount of metal start dissolving increases. Okay, increases, increases like this. Okay, now what happens? It goes up to this point. This up to Q. Now suddenly, the Q starts increasing up, and again it starts going like this. Okay, so you found that. Okay, now you start increasing this now here. Now this is what the problem is. Now we use the Q3 means what happened? The Q3 means that is completely the coating as 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 totally gone. You know. Now Q3 is where I think the coating is completely dissolved in the in the outer light. So what do we do? We determine Q3 up to this point for the undeformed metal and measure for the deformed metal, right? So Q3 for undeformed, Q3 for the deformed. The ratio gives you how much of metal is lost here, isn't it? So, for example, when metal is deformed, look at this now. The Q3 has become so reduced now, right? Why? The Q3 reduced because zinc is not available anymore. Zinc is has gone out of the surface. So, the quantum of the current due to zinc dissolution has decreased. So, uh, we use this particular concept in order to find out how much of zinc is remaining on the surface because of deformation. Twenty percent. And then thirty-nine percent strain, fifteen percent strain. So it is possible for us to use the same curve in a different manner, so that you get a different idea about what is happening at the metal surface. I am going to skip this because we don't have much of time here. Okay, um, I think uh, I think probably we are. Now I I think I will come to this important topic. One of my students worked on magnesium alloys. Is understanding magnesium alloy corrosion is a very very complicated one actually. You know? And uh, if you put a magnesium alloy, right? Put a magnesium alloy um, in water or some or, or maybe any aqueous conditions, a lot of hydrogen will start evolving. Right? Hydrogen evolves when magnesium dissolves. That is all we know about it. I mean that is not a problem, okay? Because uh, without hydrogen evolution, magnesium cannot corrode. That is not the problem. The problem was that if you polarize anodically, you polarize anodically, magnesium evolves more hydrogen. If you look at this curve, look at this, uh, look at this equation, I equal to I car, right? And this is your anodic line here and the cathodic line here. When the eta becomes positive, right? Eta becomes positive. And this should become very small, right? The cathodic reaction becomes very small, and so the current that you're seeing must be equal to the anodic reaction or magnesium reaction. But when you increase the eta positive, you found more hydrogen dissolution takes place. That is, if eta is positive, metal dissolution should increase, hydrogen evolution should decrease. If eta is negative, goes other way around. Hydrogen evolution should increase, metal dissolution should decrease. But that was one of the things. But that does not happen in magnesium. So magnesium is very very nutty material. When you are going to do anodic polarization, more hydrogen evolution takes place. So that means you need to understand why should magnesium evolve more hydrogen when you polarize anodically. Okay. 
So that is what it is. So these are some publications. If some of you have some leisure time, we have about four publications. All of them, we are trying to understand why hydrogen evolution kinetics increases when eta is positive. Okay, that was a whole lot of work that we did. We carried out this work here, and some of you have leisurely time, you can do this. So, but I'm going to be very brief and tell you how it is all useful. Now, when you are going to carry out electrochemical test, okay, you can do, you know, you are to imagine, you are to design your experiment. See, electrochemical, you are electrochemist, you are a corrosion guy, the guy, your imagination is very important. How do I carry out a test in order to address a specific problem? It's very important, actually. There is no single uh, method or you know technique to analyze it. It is uniquely designed, right? And uh, in fact, this was designed long ago by my my second PhD student, Venu Gopal. He did, he did his work for uh, aluminum alloy sacrificial anodes, and it was again used by um, the student Purva. What she did was she actually polarized the sample. This is the sample that you have here. This is the electrochemical corrosion cell, right? And you have a reference electrode here, and you have a counter electrode here, and the sample is kept here. So we start polarizing it. When you start polarizing it, you you have a what is called as um, inverted inverted um, uh, you know funnel. You see inverted funnel here, and you have burette here, right? The burette you fill the fill the burette with water, and you keep it on the funnel. So that means there is a water going to be. Uh, Going to be on the on the within the in the period. When the hydrogen starts evolving, water starts falling down. So we start measuring the amount of hydrogen that is evolved as you start polarizing it. Right. So it's a simple technique, but you will start understanding why the hydrogen evolution really takes place. Actually. Okay. So this is a this is a an elegant technique, and people also start using this kind of thing. For now, see this how. So when you start hydrogen starts liberating. You start, you know, measuring the, this one. Now, what we did was a very interesting experiment. See, see just look at. Actually. Now, this the effect of you polarize the sample anodically, more hydrogen starts evolving. That is known, but it is known only in chloride environment or some other environment. But if you take uh, if you take the magnesium alloy and dip in sodium chloride solution, there's a pitting. So when there's a pitting, it means there's a passivation. So the film is formed. The film is formed on magnesium surface, oxide film. So our idea is that when you have oxide film on the magnesium, the hydrogen evolution is stopped. Oxide film does not allow the hydrogen to liberate. When you start, when you do the anodic polarization, that is, this is sodium chloride. This is this is the polarization curve. When you when you do anodic polarization, the alloy pits. When the when the alloy pits, the bare metal surface come and bare metal surface, the hydrogen starts evolving. Please notice the corrosion potential of magnesium is about minus one point, you know, one point seven and so on. Very very negative potentials. So when you start moving the potential up, you still have huge driving force for hydrogen. Okay. So when when you when you polarize like this, the metal starts pitting. Okay. When it starts pitting, what happens? Then bare metal is exposed and so more hydrogen evolution takes place. So what she did was she took sodium bicarbonate solution and start putting and then immerse the sample in sodium bicarbonate. When you take sodium bicarbonate and put magnesium in the beginning, sodium bicarbonate dissolves all the oxide film on magnesium. So that means in this place you are going to have a bad magnesium here. Okay, we have bad magnesium, and that means this is different from this. So see, so look at a bad magnesium, how it behaves when you polarize it, and you also have magnesium formed with the film, and how it behaves when you polarize it. You start looking at here. Okay, now she calculated the hydrogen evolution on magnesium using sodium chloride solution, and she found the hydrogen that is evolved in this is is about 
0.2 ml uh, per centimeter square per day. This is the amount of hydrogen that evolves here. When you put it in a, in a sodium bicarbonate resolution, you see it's, you have a huge amount of hydrogen. It's about 11 ml of hydrogen is evolved on, on magnesium to go into bicarbonate. That means you remove the film on the surface, you find there is more hydrogen evolution. If you have a film on the surface, the hydrogen evolution becomes very less. So this has been now looking at it by various experiments like you know, hydrogen evolution versus the time. Okay, and at OCP, see that the amount of hydrogen evolved is very large on this bicarbonate solution. The amount of hydrogen evolved is very less in sodium chloride solution. That means, and you see, and then how do you know there is no film formed? You see them in the microscope. Okay, the film formed is so small, you will not be able to, uh, you know, you will not see a thick film. Whereas the film formed here is very, very thick. It doesn't form here. So, um, so, so when you when you do this experiment on bicarbonate solution, very interesting. This is at minus one point eight, right? Minus one point five, minus one point two. You carry out this in the solution. The amount of hydrogen evolved is becoming less, less and less. That means when you polarize anodically from minus one point eight, minus one point five, minus one point two, the amount of hydrogen evolved is reduced here. Why? Because this metal in the beginning is bare metal, doesn't have film. In fact, the film starts forming here, the film starts forming here, and so the hydrogen evolution is still That means there's no NDE. That means magnesium does not, by nature, show increased hydrogen evolution as you polarize anodically. It is happening on sodium chloride because sodium chloride forms a film. When you polarize anodically, the film is getting damaged, and so hydrogen evolution starts occurring on the surface. So all it means, you know, like that, you know, CC calculated hydrogen evolution rate on the surface at different potentials, you know, from minus 1.2 to minus 1.2, uh, you see here, this is for sodium chloride solution. See, for sodium chloride solution, this blue curves, the amount of hydrogen is increasing from minus, uh, you know, minus 1.8, right? It is increasing here. But for uh, sodium, uh, Carb bicarbonate, you see, is only decreasing with the potentials. So NDE does not happen in sodium bicarbonate solutions. Why does not happen? Because the metal is very, very virgin, does not form oxide films. So the oxide film is a reason for NDE. The moment you remove oxide film, and NDE does not occur. And uh, anodic polarization removes oxide film, and so hydrogen evolution takes place. So we look at the mechanism of this one. So we can start looking at the mechanisms and uh, you know what all is taking place. It's a full thesis, so we'll not be going into details. So what, in summary, what I'm trying to say here is is simple. I mean, there's no specific summary I want to make here. My, what I am trying to look at here is the perspective. You know, how will you carry out an experiment? What are the things required in order to understand electrochemical reaction? These are the factors that you should be considering when you do an electrochemical test. You should look at the thermodynamics because thermodynamics talks about whether a particular reaction can occur or not. If the thermodynamics says no, you cannot interpret other way around. So the thermodynamics, that is all electrochemical test. Coming to kinetics, electrochemical test, all you measure is current and the potentials. How do you interpret this? Depends upon your understanding of the processes of the interface. You need to use a complementary technique. For example, you can use Yeska, OJ, you know, circular technique. So these are techniques can be used. Or you analyze the solution at a given time. So these are required, or you can carry out a well-defined electrochemical test to rule out certain possibilities. These are very essential in order to analyze the electrochemical uh, polarization curves. Okay, so without that, you may tend to wrongly interpret the data. Okay, so that is uh, very important. So that is the message I want to give you through these illustrations. These are not the only 
illustrations there are different types of things actually okay to show that a complementarity is very important in order to understand or study the corrosion of metals okay so with this i would like to end my talk here and of course i'll be happy to answer any questions you have thank you sir thank you very much now we can take uh, <coughs> questions sir sir can i have one question sir yeah please go ahead uh, my name is dr ak shukla i am a professor of chemistry at one of the engineering colleges east point college in bangalore uh, it is a general you are i am talking to an expert so it is a good opportunity i can ask such a question it may be very simple or you may consider it may be stupid question but a fundamental nature we normally refer these corrosion processes with respect to metal corrosion in environment environmental oxidation or so what about uh, the organic materials which are also degrade which also degrades in atmospheric conditions oxidation say for example certain organic compounds they oxidize or certain polymers or certain um, plastic surfaces they undergo oxidation over the time has any study has been conducted that they can also be uh, considered under the category of corrosion or some or, or chemical reaction that is one thing second thing if any study is carried then what about uh, how they differ in their corrosion rate and polarization curve nature and other things can you please throw some light on this because this question puzzles me quite for quite some time yeah professor shukla i think uh, it's a very nice question and uh, it's very important question actually okay. um now we have defined the corrosion of metals so far as the oxidation of metal as yes sir we get oxidized and you know it releases electron for example yes sir yes sir see in a polymer and in fact there is some other question also i i, I saw popping up let's say ceramics for example you know uh, ceramic i mean oxide ceramics okay yes oxide sir ceramics or even the even the glasses for example that we talk about okay so they also start corrosion so when you when the definition of corrosion for us is that anything that um, anything that the interact with the chemical environment that causes the damage so within the that definition perfectly fits well right the polymer also is exposed to the environment it degrades so you call them as a corrosion as perfectly it fits very well into that now let us come to specific polymer the polymer degrades water absorption for example water gets absorbed okay and yes, there can be hydrolysis can take place you know so here there is no oxidation in the classical sense of it but what can happen the bonds can break the bonds can break maybe get hydrolyzed for example it can break swelling is is one of the part or one of the ways of degradation of polymers water will simply go and get absorbed in, into the molecules right this is the absorption right you can you can happen simply there is no even reaction the water gets into that these are all degradation of the polymer and weakens the structures now yes. this is not a electrochemical process for sure but suddenly there is a degradation of the molecule taking place now electrochemical technique 100% cannot be applied over here how you can study here is is a different science altogether for example if i want to study the polymer degradation i would rather use an ir spectroscopy and find out what are the functional groups what are the bonds that you broke so the technique that you use for degradation is entirely different you simply first of all it is you rule out that you can use see for example somebody uses a paint coating paint coating also polymer for example. there you talk about the use electrochemical technique not to understand the polymer degradation at all right it does, that doesn't talk about it. it only talks about with respect to time how much metal is vulnerable to corrosion so that technique is no way talks about polymer so it only maybe you can talk about water absorption by impedance spectroscopy for example you can use impedance spectroscopy to, to quantify the capacitance of the polymer and then so from there find out how much water has gone into it so your point is well taken and i think 
it is not possible to use semiconductor technique. The technique that you use are going to be those which characterize a polymer, like spectroscopy yes, can be used to do that. Okay. Yeah. Sir, your interpretation with respect to hydrolysis is very well undertaken and correct. What about the oxidation? This organic also undergo oxidation. Yes. Whether it is a similar phenomenon like metal oxidation? No, it is not. Released. It is only covalent reaction, perhaps. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, uh, okay. I, 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 covalent, I co point. covalent, yeah. perhaps. Okay, I, I got your point. Okay. See, of course, any oxidation process involves um, electron transfer. For example, it, it you have should carbon. release the electron, and electron yeah. can be taken as a part of current, corrosion current. Yeah, sure. Okay. I know. I, I, I got your point. For example, I simply take a carbon, I, I burn it in, in, in the air. You get carbon dioxide. There is always carbon. In fact, all the chemical reactions, most of it, you can, you can define them as oxidation reduction process. Okay. How this is different from the electrochemical reaction? Okay. Uh, the electrochemical reaction generally we define more into what, what is the difference between electro, electrochemical process and the chemical process that's the point we are like i hope it's okay for me to take some time i can do that right? we know electrochemical yeah. theory of corrosion you know <clears throat> yeah, 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 yeah. And the no but more than that more than that the electrochemical reaction is the reaction that is controlled by the application of potentials, right? When I apply a potential, right, the current can be controlled. So the rate of reaction is controlled by the potential. A chemical reaction is one which is not governed by the application of the potentials. For example, I can take a, you know a stannous chloride and take a hexavalent chromium and you can make stannic chloride. There is oxidation reduction. This swim solution, the really, titration takes place. But I, I can also convert stannous chloride to stannic chloride by applying a current. But what happens there? All the SM2 plus go to the electrode and there only get oxidized. Yeah. So the electrochemical process essentially is driven by the potential. And again, it's a heterogeneous process. There, the current is there's a vector actually, right? There's a vector. Simply the current is going to go perpendicular to the, to the electrode surfaces. So coming back to the point that whether the reaction is electrochemical or not is defined by whether the applied potential is going to control the particular particular reaction. And so, in this case, so, so in this case, the potential will not govern because it is an insulating material. Okay, so it is it is the potential whatever potential they have to apply that is immaterial for that actually. Right, the polymer will degrade on on its own. So we don't call them as electrochemical reaction because the potential has no role to play in this at all. Okay, so now you can be able to quantify the by by the, the degradation of polymer by measuring the current of that actually. So my way of looking at it is this is not an electrochemical reaction, it is a simply a chemical reaction. Okay, so you can yes, it is oxidation reduction process, but it is not an electrochemical process. This is different, please again electrochemical polymerization, different. Electrochemical polymerization means you know that's your point, sir. Yeah, that, but there is a current is forming there. Okay? So only I am talking the reference to spontaneous oxidation of a polymer surface or maybe a laminate or you know, structural material used in aeroplanes and all or paint coating, which is exposed to atmosphere. Over the time it under it also undergoes the kind of degradation process. And it may involve one of the processes, maybe the spontaneous oxidation. In that connection, I have asked. Yeah, it is corrosion. I agree, under but in fact, uh, you see, in fact, there are less people. I would rather like some good polymer chemistry people who study the corrosion of composites, polymer composites. Yes, sir. Not yes, sir. I think there is a need. Okay. Yes, yes, you are right, sir. Okay, and study of polymer composite is a corrosion only, and then the understanding of cor corrosion of polymers have a different connotation. It requires yes, a different sir. type of science itself, actually. Yes, sir. Okay? I agree. I agree. Yes, sir. Yeah. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Sir, uh, sir, Murugeshan I'm... is there? Hello. Yeah, please ask. The, please ask the question, sir. sir. You can ask. Sir, sir, I am Doctor Nitin Vasekar. Uh, uh, sir, sir, I'm... I'm... <laughs> yeah. Hello, good, sir. How are you? Good evening. Yeah, we're fine. Yeah. Uh, uh, sir, I, uh, I I saw the curves of the polarization curve for uh, zinc coating on steel. 
and there was some passivation sir but uh, i was wondering why there was passivation on seeing <laughs> that, that is that is, that is the main thing i'll go back if it's okay can i i would like to take the permission of the chair can i go back that now sir can i go back yes sir, so, yes, sir, yes sir go back and go to the sir it was really interesting to see yeah, that yeah, sir. Please, sir. see for example you see see i didn't have time for example look at these curves right look at the condensation is not due to that due to hydrogen evolution so that is why yes, you need to be extremely careful i didn't have time because this is this are typical curves you never see it in in your um, but then we go because there are a lot of complexities in what here okay let me go here okay oops Okay, uh, let's, let's look at this polarization. Yes, problem, right. I yes, sir. Some, I don't this mind. Curve. I am taking some keys. Okay. Yeah, let's look at this curve, right? Yes, sir. Let's look at the cathodic curve. There's no problem. Look at the anodic curve here. The anodic curve, uh, as you polarize, current increases. In fact, the polarization is very small because, isn't it? Because the current is, uh, you know, increasing so rapidly. Okay. The 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 zinc is does not undergo too much of anodic polarization but it undergoes cathodic polarization understandable right so that means even a small voltage you have a huge amount of current taking place now if you are if you are able to in fact it's nice to see that also if you, you see if you take this current you integrate up to this particular point okay you integrate this you integrate up to the point you convert that into coulombs and you calculate the corresponding amount of zinc you will get exactly the coating thickness okay so i so you, you can allow your computer you, either you can do manually or you can allow your software to do this so you can start integrating it up to this point of the zinc coating without deformation okay you just allow your system to integrate you can you can choose the potential range you integrate it okay so the, so you integrate this up to this point and find out the coulombs now coulombs you know you know faraday faraday's law you know that you calculate it you find you will exactly get the mass of coating equal to this q value and exactly. you stop it and take it to the microscope and see you will find there will be no coating the coating by the time is totally dissolved actually okay yes, so yes, why does the current okay now the question comes is why does the passivation come this is very interesting yes yes sir that's what you are questioning right why does it look like this let's look at this this polarization curve this is corresponding to what it corresponds to steel right yes let sir me take, yes. let me let me take a, a potential here right let me take a potential here and or i may take potential somewhere here suppose i take this potential here at this particular potential if i were to be a pure steel what should be the current here this is the amount of current i should get right yeah exactly okay but if i are to have a pure zinc what should be the current I should extrapolate this up to somewhere here. I should get this meter current, right? Suppose I assume that the coating has not gone, coating is intact. So I start extrapolating this. I should get current of this much, isn't it? This oh, should follow the same yes, line, right? So this yes. much current should form for a pure coating. For a for a for a steel, this should be current. That means what happens? Because the coating is gone, because you have steel surface, so as a fraction of the surface is is more and more steel the current is becoming less and less maximum oh, yeah, yeah. maximum current of zinc is here now what happened now steel is getting exposed 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 like that right so yeah, yeah. steel i will not get that much current got it sir got okay? it sir. so what so the, the so the interpretation is totally different now you see now how we interpret depend upon how we visualize so now the guy now you see here both are same huh? now we see here, both are same yeah, Still, totally disappeared. Everything now. is still there. Still there. Now, so is what? So, so, so this is Q1, Q2, Q3. Q3 is going to get. Okay. So this is how we start interpreting because so that means how we can interpret unless you get an idea. Zinc cannot passivate in sodium chloride solution. If you have that idea, automatically strikes in the front of your eyes. Hey, there's a problem, and so you do. But nevertheless, I always tell people when you do a polarization, please take it to microscope. Please see that. Please, heaven's sake, you don't lose anything. See them in the microscope. You get an idea about what is going on. Metallographic corrosion are always has to be good. Okay. This yes, is very, very thank important. you, sir. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Got it, sir. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. I think Murugesh uh, 
Murugeshan, you got uh, you know answer for all your question. There are few more things you have put like a small change in potential range can give large error in e car and i car. Yeah. yeah. Can, can I can I ask one question, Professor uh, Shukla? Uh, sorry. Uh, yeah, please, please continue, sir. Continue, sir. You ask. Him. Hello. Murugeshan, you continue with your question. Yes. Yeah. Go ahead. Actually, see. Uh, thanks, Professor Raja. Actually, it is a wonderful talk. Actually, I really enjoy it. Actually. Thanks, uh, so, so one thing just I wanted to ask you that uh, really it is an interview, wonderful insight to not to get confused directly with the normal interpretation like but uh, one thing I would like to know is that uh, in case of uh, oil field emulsions yes see normally when you see in weight loss measurements and all when we start doing it any kind of thing and you'll be finding all kinds of patterns on the coupon and we take out the test and all but yes. the interpretation of such kind of data in electrochemical systems, especially how difficult or how, what is your uh, yeah. advice on this? See, the most important thing in, in my view yeah. for a person to uh, feed is they should know the limitation of the electrochemical technique. Yeah. If people do not, uh, you know, get the limitation of the experiment, they start doing all kinds of things. <laughs> Now, in my view, if you talk about crude oil, uh, you know, corrosion rate measurements, actually, right? mm -hmm. and uh, there the water may be very small amount, and so you cannot pass current. In fact, if you look at data on on biodiesel, all kind of things, yeah, this is not aqueous system. You still cannot pass current. You cannot use electrochemical technique at all because current does not flow into the system. In fact. In fact if you ask me, if you carry out a corrosion studies in pure water, itself is very difficult. You have to correct for IR drop, all kind of stuff. We didn't have time to look at it. The point coming to you is that electrochemical technique is simply not possible. Let's accept that. Actually. Now, still, we need to understand corrosion, right? So yeah. that means we are going to use non-electrochemical techniques in order to do this. You can do many ways, actually. For example, suppose you have you have taken a you have taken a coupon and you put it in crude oil, you put an inhibitor, right? Mm -hmm. What I can do is I take the coupon out of the inhibitor and put it and measure this corrosion potential. Right? I'll find out how long it takes for the corrosion potential to come back to this. That itself it talks about the persistent, how long the inhibitor is staying, how long oil is staying. So look at so you can devise your own way of doing it. Or you take the coupon out, put it in water, you carry out inhibitor studies, take the time. How long it takes for the metal to come back to its normal impedance? It talks about a persistent. Okay, so you can use this technique indirectly. How do I do it? Because I know this technique cannot do this, but I also know what is going on in the surface. If I know that surface is having oil, it has got, for example, inhibitor, it may take longer time for for me to get into the, the corrosion potential. But again, they are not quantitative. See again. The point again we have to look at is that we are trying to understand what is going on at the interface. Right? So, like that, you can tailor your technique and then try to get a piece of information that you're looking at. Okay? So, this is a jigsaw puzzle. So, you put all the techniques together, you construct the story, and you can act on it. Okay? So, again, most important thing is you should realize. What is the limitation of the See, that is not only for electrochemical technique. That for that matter, any technique has a limitation. Electrochemical technique has even more limitation because you can't see that. They are in there. You have a black box. I think there's one person, Murugai, and is not able to talk. Maybe he has some comment. Uh, comment, he has sent some comment on uh, this. Sir, actually, he has an, uh, you know, one more question. Yeah. Hear me now? That what are, are the guidelines to, to select potential range? What are the range of potential that you choose? See, and uh, you know, it's a very, very important, uh, you know, it's like, you know, a health diagnosis, right? Simply you get a fever, you cannot say that you're due to something else. Why I'm using this, this terminology is, 
each system is different. For example, you are looking at, let's say, if you are looking only at TAFL, for example, right? Then it is very clear, you do not go beyond 250 millivolt on either side, 200 millivolt. There, your whole idea is only to get I car value, get a TAFL. You do not have more than anything else, or maybe exchange current density, you would like to know, get this. But that is not the only thing you may be interested, right? Suppose you want to know where there is a passive motion. It's a changing, right? And in some cases, you like to study the corrosion behavior with respect to time. You know, metal may change. And if you don't choose a very high voltage, you may go to linear polarization. So what range you choose, <coughs> trans system. Now, there are a lot of checks and balances that you can also do. For example, if you are going to do a table extrapolation, you have to be clear that there is a clear TAFL region of one decay linearity, not very close to ECAR, it should be above 50 millivolt linearity. You should get the linearity at all. You don't get a linearity, I think the experiment, either you didn't do a proper experiment, you have done it, TAFL is not valid. You simply have to be happy with that. Please don't force your view onto it and get the data, that's not right. Otherwise, you give the same data to five people, five people to get different e car value and i car values. Okay. So these are basically should be done. Sir, that's your sir. Suppose if sir. you will select the potential, no? When yeah. you select the potential, very small change, the slope itself will change if you select the potential range. Even small change in potential, it will alter the slope uh, enormously. So that's why you have to select the suitable potential to select the TAFL region. So that's what, uh, that uh, selecting the potential is very crucial to find out the I-core value. So that's okay. what uh, my doubt. So okay, 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 now I understand what you're telling. So what is the potential range where you, you can draw the TAFL line? Is it what your question? Uh, yeah, yes, sir. Okay, so not the potential range to carry out experiment, right? You are talking about the potential range. Asking the range, suppose even if you are very close to the I peak, okay. then so will be horizontal. So if you go away, it will become vertical, it will become vertical. So the appropriate potential is very essential, then only we can get the correct I-core value. So that's very important. So that's what I thought. See, that is very important, but the point you need to look at it, what is the correct thing? See, one way to look at it is, you can take the bottle warmer equation, right? You take the whole equation. Yeah. You put the eta value there and you find out the error involved there. See, <laughs> see if you, you can, we can make, see, it's not very difficult, huh? You take okay. the bottom of the equation to okay. find out what different eta value, okay. what kind of error you are going to get. Okay. okay. Because this is again an approximation, right? Eta yes. is very large. You are going to say positive. You are saying that this cathode reaction is negligible. You don't say zero, right? Yeah. So yeah. one way to do is you yes. get off. Okay. You get, you, you have carried out the experiment. You made some approximate E car, I car, all the value tabs when you got it. Then yes. to fit into the equation and find out what should be the eta value to get an error of 1% okay. and 1%, you can do that. Okay, So it is it's, it's, it's possible. So that is why I am saying it is not that, it is not subjective, you know, it cannot be subjective. It has to be objective. Objective is what error you get by choosing the eta. Same thing you can do for linear also. Okay? So these all you can do by making a calculation by using the bottle warm equation that what eta value I'm going to use, what error I'm going to get in I car value. Okay, sir. Okay, Professor, thank we you. Have, Hello, we sir. have one more question. Uh, Dr. Arun Murthy, you can go ahead with your question, please. Uh, yes. Thank you, Dr. Nagaswar. Uh, uh, good evening, Dr. Uh, Raja sir. Your uh, presentation was very nice. We have learned a lot of techniques and a lot of uh, uh, knowledge about these polarization uh, techniques. Uh, I am uh, from uh, Adama Science and Technology University, Ethiopia. Uh, uh, previously, I worked with uh, some uh, uh, ceramic particle reinforcements and uh, aluminium uh, matrix. So we prevent you know, the corrosion by reinforcing the ceramic particles like titanium carbide, titanium oxide. So now my, uh, my question is, does the, the particle size of these uh, reinforcements uh, affect uh, the, uh, the corrosion behavior in general, sir? It's, it's a good question and uh, thank you, Dr. Rao, I think. Uh, 
Um, yeah, it's it's a very interesting question. Okay. Um, see, corrosion occurs on the metal surface. You are modifying the metal surface. The corrosion is a surface phenomenon. We all know about it. Right? Now, the surface has got uh, you know use a composite. You have a particle, and you have matrix, and between the particle and the matrix, you know there is an interface. The interface may have certain chemistry composition, whatever can happen at all. Essentially, it is not a chemically homogeneous surface. Chemically, it is going to be heterogeneous surface. So, the particle size, it is possible, it can affect the the matrix and the particulate interface. It can affect one thing. Okay. So. The volume fraction of the particulate also can affect. So you can also use a simple uh, law of mixture if the particulate does not corrode at all. For example, you can have a particulate which may have a differential corrosion rate. It may be corroding less than that of the matrix, or it is totally inert. We are going to even outside, for example. Then is a law of mixture can happen. But the interface between the particulate particulate and the matrix may have some segregation. That may depend upon the energy of the particle. Kind of things. So there is a possibility that it can vary. Now, question is, how do you find out? You carry out an experiment. In fact, when you do a, for example, I I hope you are able to see this diagram here, right? Yes, Suppose sir. I hold the sample somewhere here, right? Okay. I hold it for about let's say for half an hour. I hold it for half an hour, and take it to the microscope and see what happens, right? If the interface is getting attacked, okay, automatically there is a problem there. Right, so interface is getting applied at all. So one way to do is that put them in at corrosion potential, for example, wait for half an hour, doesn't happen, and you can hold it at different potentials and see that how sensitive the interface is and how selectively getting attacked. So if you have a microscope, I would recommend that post polarization, you take it to the microscope, see then how the attack is taking place, especially when you have microstructures. Microscope examination is a very important one to look at actually. Okay, so so that you can idea. And then if you have a, if you have a some kind of uh, you know profilometer, you can look at the depth of attack. All these are possible. So you have to have a complementary technique to uh, totally understand corrosion of this composite material. Okay. Thank you very much, sir, for your. Uh, sir, can I have one more question? Please, please go ahead. Yeah, I'm again Dr. Shukla. Sir, uh, I have come across in, in the recent years uh, the, another technique called pulse voltammetry is in use in, elect in studying electrochemical phenomena or electrochemical reactions. Whether pulse voltammetry can be used here to study the corrosion studies in the same way, and what are the advantages of this technique over the conventional voltammetry or cyclic voltammetry? Let me put this uh, this one, okay. Uh, let me try to explain this way. Um, see, the cyclic voltammetry, and you also have galvanostatic transients, photostatic transients, okay, or that matter, even electrochemical impedance spectroscopy. These are all uh, transient techniques, right? Transient techniques. In fact, ideally, when you carry out a polarization, you should carry out at a very, very slow scan rate. In fact, you can also calculate what is the allowable scan rate for that. You know, there is a calculation so you can do that. See, basically, what happens when you are going to apply a current at the interface? Now, a part of the current is used for the electrochemical reaction. We all know, right? Part of the current is used to polarize the electrical surfaces. If there is a fast scan, then what happens? The current that we are going to measure is not the Faraday current. We are going to get a non-Faraday current, the current that is used to charge the double A. So you are going to misinterpret that as what? That as the overall corrosion process. That's why if you do a polarization in terms of different scan rates, you see that passive current density is decreasing all. Of course, there's also corrosion, also time-dependent process. You know, it takes time to build the passive layer and all. But apart from that, you have these problems. So when you do a cyclic voltammetry, for example, what is your objective? 
if your objective is to look at some intermediates that are formed on the circuit. For example, you have FE2 plus, FE3 plus, you know, something you want to put in this model, okay? So you can, you can do that. You can identify the potential at which they are happening, right? So we need to define the objectives of that. If you don't define the objective of that, you are simply measuring, please understand, you measure only current, you are only applying potential or vice versa, right? So the response of this, we need to, we need to be clear up front. What is that I'm mentioning? So, so we can do a series of cyclotomy. For example, if you are going to have redox systems, having so many, uh, you know, intermediate things, you will get a lot of peaks uh, appearing in different, different things, right? But if you take a steel, you are going to do a cyclotometry. I'm not going to be sure we are going to resolve Fe2 plus Fe2 plus so nicely because the reactions that occur on the surface are very complex actually. I am not saying that no metal, no corrosion can be done at all. Okay? That is not, again, my point. My point is, in a given system, how much it is amenable to probe the phenomena that you are interested in, actually. Okay? So that is, if it, that is done, you can use the cyclovotometry, you can do that. In fact, cyclic watermetry is done uh, in pitting studies to find out the pitting and pit growth. But in fact, that is done at a very, very slow scandal. That is doing a very slow rate. You know, this is done very, very slow, slow standard. For example, you want to look at the diffusion processes. Yeah, you can do a very, very fast scans and see what will happen with all. Or you want to look at the double layer capacitance. In fact, those days, people use all the transient techniques uh, in order to uh, get these things now. But now with the impedance coming in, you know, some of the transient techniques people really don't do that. So, um, so, so this is these are the things again. You know, you you have to, you have to have a, a period, or at least some kind of hypothesis that you make it, and check that it is not possible again. We consider the hypothesis and then check it. So it is again going to be working on what you think is happening at the electrochemical interface. And how these IV curves are going to uh, reveal the information that you're seeking at all, actually. Okay. So otherwise, I you see I, I why I'm saying is I've seen several papers people do for the sake of uh, you know IVs, and I do not see too much information coming from that at all. So uh, it's, it's not necessary is going to give good information. But there are some cases, yes, I do see that uh, you know this information is coming uh, from the uh, from cyclic automatically. Uh, or pulse also can do that. See, pulse when you do it means diffusion is not there, isn't it? So essentially you are you're trying to avoid diffusion um, uh, free corrosion processes, right? That's what you're going to do that. I hope I have partly answered your question. Yeah, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. sir, I think uh, we have completed all the questions, attended, taken all the questions, sir. Sir, sir, Raman. I think Hello. we don't have no more questions. No more questions, sir. I just checked it at the One more last yes. question. Somebody is asking. Somebody is there? Okay, okay, sir. Uh, sir, this is Saravanan. Yeah, Are you <laughs> Oh, nice, huh? Nice to see. Yeah. Sir, sorry. It was disconnected, actually. Is, okay. uh, what I was saying, uh, I have read the papers on pulse, um, the pulse modulated over time, it has been used for electro deposition processes. Yes, yes. So since it can be used for electro deposition or electrolytic process, I am sure it can also be applied to uh, spontaneous corrosion process too. But only thing, uh, I have no experience. I wonder whether they have some advantages. That's why I have posed this question to you, sir. Yeah, see, that's why when you come back to the question, see, in a pulse electrode deposition, essentially what we're doing, you know, in the electrode deposition, what happens is you get a dendritic growth, right? The dendritic growths are generally related to diffusion control processes. Yes, sir. Now, in order to avoid dendritic growth, either you can you can add some, some additives and all, you can do that, or you can do a pulse deposition. In pulse deposition, what happens? There's on time, off time, and in the off time, the, the diffusion layer is is getting eliminated almost like right so you're not allowing the in the concentration gradient across the um, across the metal uh, solution interface and so this this um, um, this uh, this dendritic growth is provided actually. also it also increases the number of nuclei also right so the fine grains are going to take place so the purpose there is simply 
to in to, to to improve the to putting uh, you know fine coatings on the surfaces but if you are going to do this in the in the uh, in the corrosion what happens is again there is a relationship right see all this so when you are doing this now um when you are doing this again if, if, if you in fact if you look at the the board book how to deal with the diffusion is a very interesting thing see when you are going to do this pulse and all now there is always a time lag between the current and the potential because either over voltage or also diffusion control process so you are going to complicate your current potential relationships and so you are not able to interpret what is going on in the surfaces at all actually right whereas in a, in a steady state one uh, where you have dc thing you have less less of a problem so the pulse things generally in my view is not done okay. the pulse things are done that you do in the case of impedance spectroscopy right you have a sinusoidal voltage and you measure sinusoidal current and then you look at the you know face uh, face uh, you know uh, face shift then you get impedance and all you do that so, so such kind of things in my view if I'm not sure how much you are going to get out of that actually. But if you do this, then you should you should have a governing relation between current and voltage for such kind of uh, technique. You know? So so that is that is that is a really so that is that is sir, please, sir, next question, please. Yeah. Okay, thank you, sir, very much. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Yeah. Sir, this is Saravanan. Ah, uh, tell me that Saravanan. Yeah. Yes, sir. This is regarding that uh, hydrogen evolution technique. Yes. Can you go to that slide, sir? I'll do that. Okay. Yes. This one, right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. Sir, is this how many? Is there any standard procedure? Is there how many days we have to do it? Means time of uh, this thing. And uh, what is the potential we have to apply? Is it uh, hold good for I mean, same thing for uh, steel samples also? So these are the questions. Yeah. See, Any kind of question? Yeah. yeah. Well, let's see. Um, okay. See, essentially, the purpose of this test is to determine the quantum of hydrogen that is evolved on the metal surface. Okay. Now, if, we, if, the, if the, the quantum of hydrogen that is evolved on the surface is very small, that can happen at low or over voltage, right? At higher over voltage, you get a lot of hydrogen. And the corrosion potential, the amount of hydrogen evolved may be less also can happen. Yes. yes. In that case, what happens? You should go for a, 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 a burette, not normal burette. You should go for a burette of a, maybe a micro burette, right? I mean, so you have to go for a smaller burette so that any small variation in the in the volume they have to reflect at all and uh, i think steel and the wall the amount of hydrogen evolution is less can happen but you're looking at pickling and all you know a lot of hydrogen will start evolving right yes sir. so this is simple this setup is very very simple you just need only a funnel which is inverted funnel here and you need burette but the, how can you quantify this is a displacement uh, of water so if the volume of hydrogen the liberator is very small, that means you have to go for a burette, which has got a finer grading, grading, right? So you have to go for that. So again, you have to have an idea about what is the estimated amount of hydrogen, or you have to do some trial, okay? How much you can do. For example, you know, Purva did the work and she collected, you know, you see this thing here, she collected how much hydrogen? She collected uh, nearly about what? About uh, 0.12 ml per day. Okay. Yeah, so it's very small amount of hydrogen. So you have to call up more time. There are also can complexities actually, which I did not tell you here. Initially, the hydrogen also start dissolving water. So in the yes, beginning, you are not able to uh, measure the all hydrogen so 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 well. Either you have to saturate the high water with the, with the hydrogen. So actually, I mean, there are uh, if you can read the papers, you will be able to see that actually. So uh, but but point here is that I can measure hydrogen. That are evolved on the metal surfaces and relate that metal hydrogen evolved to the corrosion process. How much of uh, uh, corrosion is related only to oxygen evolution? How much it go to? Oh, sorry, oxygen reduction process. How much is related to hydrogen evolution process? I can I can I can quantify it actually, right? So this is this is uh, possible. So these are um, method. I I don't know whether any ASTM standard available at all actually, right? Actually, this this work was first. Uh, 
done by Venugopal when he wanted to do, uh, characterize its uh, aluminum alloy factory with anodes to quantify the efficiency. Actually. But Purva and nowadays a lot of people work on this. So how many days they did, sir? How many days? How I many days? It, yeah, you see here, how many, see, now what, see, CS, CS, for example, some experiments he cut down in 20 hours. Some of them he went out to 80 hours, hours right? And uh, in this case, he went just only 8 hours only. So, so because magnesium evolves a lot of hydrogen, corrosion is... Uh, after that, it will become stable. Become stable, as you saw. See, you look at the potential of magnesium, you know, Look at the potential yes. of magnesium. It's so pretty low. You see here, minus 1.8. Yes. You know, you will not get uh, that kind of potential for steel at all, right? So the amount yes, of battery yes. involved on steel is much less actually as mm. compared to this one. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. So nice so <laughs> hearing you. Yeah, good. So it was actually it was very uh, it was a old memory. It was a old memory that I was in a class. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I'm just uh, kind of review of uh, what I kind of review of Now I request uh, Dr. Prasanna to conclude the session. Dr. Prasanna, you are there? Now I request uh, Dr. Uh, good evening, Sorok, uh, uh, it was a uh, very good uh, informative talk we had uh, almost for uh, two hours, I think, Dr. Naksorok. <laughs> we started by 4.20 and now we are ending at 6.20. I think now we have to change the time from 4 to uh, what we mentioned is 4 to 5.30. So we can make it as 4 to uh, 7 like that. <laughs> Lot of discussion and all. Okay, it was very uh, informative uh, as uh, the earlier uh, uh, person who asked the question mentioned, we felt like uh, we were sitting in uh, class. Okay, so it was very, very informative, sir. On behalf of uh, ECSA and Department of Nanotechnology, I thank uh, Professor uh, Raja for a very informative lecture and enlightening us uh, uh, about this uh, uh, basic. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much for accepting our That's invitation. Okay. Thanks for all and the participants uh, for the wonderful question. Yeah. Dharma, special, uh, uh, special thanks to Professor Raja. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Uh, tomorrow, we have, uh, uh, tomorrow we have Dr. Santosh Kumar D. Bhatt. He's a principal scientist and associate professor at uh, CSIR Central Electrochemical Research Institute, that is CSIR SICRI. So you'll be uh, giving talk on polymer electrolyte fuel cells for uh, stationary. Uh, in the material applications, four PM sharp. webinar. Thank you. Raja sir, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. Thank you very much. It's wonderful to be and uh, giving talk in the society all as always. I like to be a part of it. Thank you. Thanks for thanks for organizing. Sir, I told I told you it was up to five thirty, but we went up three thirty. Sorry, we extended the time because of the you know, the session was very interesting and the discussion. And the discussion. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I thank Professor Raja sir and all the participants. Thank thanks, thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Professor, sir, we log out for the day. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. 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 Thank